This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Funding for this program was provided by the UCLA Office of Instructional Development. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to Scott for that fulsome introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, an unexpected honor. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you today about a mummy, of all things. Now, I have to tell you also that the last time I spoke about Lennon's mummy, I was invited to give a, an interview on a television network, and I thought, great. Historians love to be on TV. And so I gave a, a, a scientific, technical evaluation of the mummification process and how it was done and how it was preserved. I was very excited. Uh, I went back and I told all my friends when it was going to be on. I told my family when it was going to be on. Uh, at home, we gathered around the TV. My kids were excited. Dad's going to be on TV. Dad's going to be on TV. Well, it started, and to my horror, it was a cartoon a cartoon in which 10 mummies were presented and you were supposed to vote for your favorite mummy. <laughs> to my double horror, Lennon came in 10th. <laughs> King Tut won in a landslide. I'm hoping to do better today. I'm hoping that what comes out of this is better than a cartoon. Before I actually get to Lennon, though, I want to try to put this in a, in a kind of a theoretical context. I'm sure many of you remember how history used to be taught and how it's still taught some places. Events, chronologies, dates, battles. It was about memorizing things. Um, it was, in the words of one of my colleagues, one damn thing after another. <laughs> Lately, though, history has begun borrowing from sociology, from anthropology, from other disciplines. Um, in addition to our traditional chronology, we're now interested in, in structures of culture, which anthropologists have been interested in a long time. Rituals, things like language, history, self-understanding, recognition, self-identity, political practices. And history has now begun to, in, begun to incorporate these studies of cultural structures, very long-term durable cultural structures. I mean, these are the things that make up a people, a culture. We started looking at them and trying to figure out the relationship between events and structures of culture. That's going to be the theme of my talk today. I'm going to try to put the mummification process of Lenin into a, into a cultural scheme. In short, people often say, People are products of their history, products of their culture. Well, they are and they aren't at the same time, but I'm going to talk to you today about an event, the decision to preserve Lenin's body, but an event that reflected a culture. That event, like other events, can't be understood without reference to the culture that it comes from. It's not enough to look at an event along with the interests and the motivations of the players and then interpret it somehow. Historical actors function within a culture, and it's often a culture that they themselves are not conscious of. Frequently we do things informed by our past, informed by our culture, and we don't recognize what, they're, what they are or why they're doing it. A sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu, famously said, quote, tradition is silent, silent about itself as tradition. People do not, strictly speaking, know what they are doing or why they are doing it. Things they do have more meaning than they know." 
unquote. And I'm going to argue today that that, in fact, is the context of the decision to mummify Lenin. That it was done on an ad hoc basis. No one knew exactly why they were doing it. It took them years to figure out that they were doing it. But in the final analysis, we can understand what they couldn't. We can understand that this decision was informed by ancient Russian cultural structures. So, what are we talking about? Everybody knows Lenin is embalmed, available to this day for public display. He's the founder of the Soviet state and was seen as a heroic figure. He was the interpreter of Marx to fit Russia. He was the leader of a party that went from the lunatic fringe to running the country by 1917. He was the leader of the revolution. He was the founder of the state, the Soviet state. He was the George Washington of the USSR, if you want to think of it that way. I wouldn't stretch that too far, necessarily. But an interesting point here is that George Washington's body, his mummy, is not on display. It would seem strange and odd if it were. It wouldn't fit our culture. What I'm going to try to explain today is why it did and does fit Russian culture. Lenin's body is on display in a specially constructed mausoleum since 1924. It's a place of honor and reverence. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There are huge lines, shorter than they used to be, but still long lines to see him. He's a tourist attraction in some ways. In Soviet times, not only foreigners wanted to see Lenin, but Russians from outside Moscow would come thousands of miles to see the body. It was, in some ways, the place, the event, and you had to get there early if you were going to get in at all. You may remember that for a long time, the leaders of the country, the Politburo, stood on top of the mausoleum and watched parades go by. It was their tribune. It was their place. The changing of the guard in front of Lenin's tomb was also a tourist attraction. Three goose-stepping soldiers came out and replaced three who were standing there. It was called, by the way, guard post number one of the Soviet army. And it was presented, and still is presented, inside like a church. It's a sacred relic. There's a religious atmosphere here. The lighting is dark. Funeral music. It's like a church. Just like in a church, by the way, an Orthodox church, you can't have your hands in your pockets. It's disrespectful. It's irreverent. If you accidentally put your hands in your pockets in the Lenin mausoleum, a guard will run over and take them out. The door to the mausoleum, the outside door, was always in Soviet times just a little bit ajar, just a little bit open. The other place in Russia with a door that's just a little bit open is inside an Orthodox church on special occasions. The iconostasis in the front, the door is open just a little bit because behind it is sacred space. Behind it is God's space. In many ways, therefore, the mausoleum presents itself as a church. There's more to the religious angle, too. In Russian Orthodoxy, the bodies of saints don't decay. They're preserved forever. Their body parts can still be found in churches today and are objects of worship. They're holy objects. The mausoleum, therefore, functioned as a kind of a spiritual center of communist Moscow. Like the cathedral of communism in the center of the city, like most medieval cathedrals were. And it was a religious place, or seemed to be a religious place. Lenin's body was meticulously cared for by the Soviet leadership. To this day, every summer, for one month, Lenin goes on what they call vacation. <laughs> His body is immersed in a special chemical bath the composition of which is still a state secret of the Russian Federation. 
This bath is what preserves him. And it is said that if you scraped skin samples from the mummy and looked at them under the microscope, they would be practically indistinguishable from living cells. For a month, therefore, Lennon bathes. And this is what keeps him in, I suppose you would say, top condition, as he is now. The care of Lenin's body in Soviet times was under the direct control of the secret police, the NKVD, later the KGB. It was that important. The secret police were entirely responsible for the body. Here you have a letter from the dreaded head of the secret police. You may have heard of him, Lavrenti Beria, who ran the secret police under Stalin for a couple of decades. Beria here is writing to the head of government, Molotov, Stalin's right-hand man, with a lengthy and precise description of a small patch of the body's skin that seemed to be changing color. This was a matter for the highest echelons of government. A small piece of skin was changing color. Nothing could be more important. This got on the Politburo agenda right up there with nuclear arms talks. Beria even sketched a small piece of the skin in his letter. It's hard to imagine anything more important than that for the top Soviet leadership. In 1941, when the Germans were assaulting Moscow in World War I, Stalin decided to evacuate Moscow to the rear. The first thing evacuated, you guessed it, Lenin's body. His body was evacuated under cover of night in a special train with an air escort before the government was evacuated before anything else was evacuated. It was the most important thing to preserve. The big question, of course, why? Why in a modern state, a state that put the first man in space, a space that had enormous technological progress and valued science and valued technology, why a mummy? This is something you'd expect from an archaic ancient society, even maybe. But here it is. Here it is in a modern state. Why? And why was it so highly prized? Why was it the most important thing to keep out of the Germans' hands? This is the question I was trying to go at when I started this research. Now, one answer is kind of simple. This is just a cynical use by the regime to make a play for peasant religion. After all, they executed the czar. They needed to substitute czar. There's one land right there. They destroyed the Orthodox Church, but they couldn't destroy religion, so they tried to create a substitute. Look at this mausoleum. It's just like a church. In other words, this can be understood as nothing more than a backroom cynical decision to create symbolic legitimacy for a regime of atheists in a peasant country. There was some of that, but it's much more complicated than that. What I'm going to look at next is how the decision was made and why a body of all things. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things about how the decision was made is that in the top secret Politburo archives where this committee met to decide Lenin's funeral and his body, the interesting thing to me, behind closed doors, to each other, to themselves, nobody said this was useful. Nobody said, what a clever thing to do. What a neat trick on peasants. What a good way to put up a fake religion. Nobody said that, even in their most secret councils. How was the decision made? Well, I was lucky enough to spend a couple of years in the files, the Politburo files, of the commission to decide the fate of Lenin's body. These, until a couple of years ago, were top secret. This is what the Bolsheviks said to each other in private. So, the questions I was after, how did they decide this? And why, in the end, did they decide this slightly gruesome mummy? Why? Why not just a statue to commemorate Lenin? Some other kind of monument, perhaps, however gigantic and lavish, 
This is what Lenin's wife wanted, by the way, a modest monument. She was horrified at the idea of preserving his body. Horrified. After all, what they did, creating a holy relic in a kind of a pseudo church, is not very Marxist at all. Marxists don't believe that there's a soul. They believe that when you die, your body is just a body. It's just a mess of chemicals. It's nothing. One old Bolshevik actually wrote a book prescribing what Bolsheviks should do to their comrades' bodies when they die. And he came up with what soon became a popular opinion. They should be burned and ground up and sent to a soap factory. Because then at least they'd be useful. Marxists and Bolsheviks had nothing to say about bodies, nothing to do about bodies. Yet, look what they did. They preserved a body and put it, I'm going to argue here, almost by accident, in a shrine. Along with preserving Lenin comes a whole bunch of cultural attributes. One of the most popular slogans in the Soviet period, especially for young people, and you saw it on badges and you saw it on flags, Lenin lived, Lenin lives, Lenin will live. That speaks to immortality, something Bolsheviks are not supposed to believe in. Lenin's still alive? What? Lenin will be alive in the future? What? How communist is that? In fact, the whole body laying there with its accompanying slogans speaks of immortality, a very unmarxist thing a very uncommunist, unbolshevik thing, a very unscientific thing, a lot of people would argue. I remember once standing in front of the mausoleum many years ago, looking at the front, and a, a young Soviet kid came up to me, must have been about 12. His first question, the, the, always the first question in those days, who are you and where you're from? I said I was an American. So he decided to give me a little education there on the spot. He said, you know why that door is open just a little bit? Well, I had my suspicions that it was kind of like a church thing. He said, it's open a little bit, so if he decides to get out, he can. <laughs> this wasn't a joke on foreigners. There was no smile here. He sincerely believed that. You know, some kind of resurrection might happen. It was within his cultural field of vision that Lenin might get up and walk out and save the planet. What we have here, therefore, is immortality, implicitly and with a lot of people, explicitly. How'd they come up with this? What was this committee thinking? Well, a couple of things to notice right away, and this part surprised me. Stalin was not involved in the decision at all. He was not a member of the committee. He only rubber-stamped their reports periodically when they came to the Politburo. This was not Stalin's idea. Instead, the committee was chaired by the first head of the secret police, a man named Dzerzhinsky. You can't imagine a more hard-boiled, cynic, communist guy than Felix Dzerzhinsky, who at the stroke of a pen could send 200 people to their execution and then go home and write romantic poetry. The Organization of the committee, therefore, didn't speak at all of immortality or emotion or anything like that. In fact, they didn't have a plan. At the beginning, Lenin died. They organized his funeral. Okay, what do we do with the body? Well, there were crowds of people coming from all over the country to view Lenin's body. He was lying in state in a building at, in the beginning. Huge crowds wrapped around blocks in Moscow. So, for crowd control, they moved the body to a temporary wooden building on Red Square. Temporary building. The idea was that when the crowds died down, they'd bury him somewhere. In fact, there were discussions about where to bury him, who to bury him with. The idea of having him on display, therefore, was a, a temporary stopgap for crowd control. The problem was the crowds kept coming and coming and coming. Lenin died in January, and by April, the crowds were still coming. Something had to be done because the weather was warming up. <laughs> it was okay to put a dead body out in Moscow January, you know, but
But by April or May, you know, he's going to go south on you pretty quick. So what do we do next, they said. Well, let's figure out a way to keep him a little longer until the crowds die down, a little longer. So they ordered the construction of a, of a slightly larger wooden mausoleum to cover him and began looking at ways, I mean, how do we keep the body from rotting? There was a group that wanted to freeze him. Another group um, wanted to, you know, basically plasticize him with shellac. Uh, all different kinds of ideas were, were gone over in the committee. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how long he needed to be preserved. Surely the crowds would stop coming at some point and we can bury the guy. They didn't stop coming. What they finally came up with was the recipe of Professor Abrakozov, which by the way means apricot in Russian. Professor Apricot came up with the formula to preserve lemon. And as I said, it's still a secret. But delegates from the Pollock Bureau went south where, where Apri Apricot lived, and he was able to present five bodies of conf, conf, con, excuse me, convicts whom he had perfectly preserved for years with his special bath. Great, they said. They brought him back to Moscow, put him in charge of preserving the body just a little longer, <laughs> along with the uh, provision since the committee was headed by the secret police, this better work or you're dead. <laughs> it did work. But it was still five years before the committee, after much debate, came around to the idea of a permanent building, a stone building rather than some temporary wooden structure here. The, literally, they stumbled into the final decision. That final decision being permanently preserving Lenin in a permanent stone building. It was a series of incremental decisions, a series of stopgap decisions. Nobody really knew what they were doing. Now what they did do, almost accidentally, was create a kind of a religious relic. But they furiously denied to each other on the committee that that's what they were doing. This isn't a relic, oh no. This isn't religious, oh no. We're just doing this because he's a great man. As Dzerzhinsky, the head of the committee said, the question here is not why, but why not? <laughs> they just did it. They stumbled into doing it. Some people on the committee were violently opposed to this. One man, Voroshilov, the Minister of Defense, said this is not Marxist. This is not Bolshevik. He said, we can't very well go out there in the country and attack religion and then make one. The peasants will see through it. We can't attack peasant religion and then adopt it. We don't need a body, Voroshilov said. I've been to London and I've seen Marx's grave, he pointed out. There's a nice monument, respectful monument on the grave, but there's no body laying out there. It works without a body. We don't need a body. Turns out they did, but they weren't sure why. It turns out that they created a religious, religious relic without knowing it and with affirming to each other that that's not what they were doing. Remember Pierre Bourdieu here, subjects people do not, strictly speaking, know what they're doing. And what they're doing has more meaning than they know. A lot of times, events happen organized and orchestrated by specific people who can't themselves explain why they're doing it. That's what happened here with this committee, which met five years arguing about this, arguing about this constantly. I've seen this at work, by the way, personally. My friend Tatiana, a medical doctor, specializes in hormones, an atheist, a hardcore scientific person. More than that, a Communist Party member. More than that, a Communist Party secretary for ideology. There's nobody more hardcore than, hardcore than that in the Soviet Union. Secretary for ideology. When her husband, Leonid, died, I attended his funeral. They were friends of mine. And was amazed 
to see a priest, censers, a small choir, a headstone with a cross on it, a typical Russian Orthodox traditional funeral. And I said to Tanya afterwards, I said, Tanya, what's this? You're a communist, you're an atheist. You don't believe in this stuff. Why did you give Leonid this kind of funeral? And she got this frown on her face and she thought about it and she said, and the members of the commission could have said this too, I don't know, this is just what we do. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to at Russian funerals when I ask why this or why that or why the other thing. We don't know. It's just what we do. It's what our parents did. It's what our grandparents did. This is a kind of a powerful culture structure or series of structures that frequently informs decisions without direct reference to it. The way it came out a body preserved forever, turned out to be perfectly consistent with peasant understandings. The cult of the body looked very much like the cult of a saint, didn't decay. Some peasants thought it had curative powers and tried to touch it to heal disease when they went by. Some peasants believed that if political deviance could simply be brought under the, pe the presence of the body, their false ideology would be healed and cured. People were arrested for trying to photograph the body, for trying to caress it. Now, the leaders of the committee faced with this magicization of the body were appalled, absolutely appalled. They ordered the guards, don't let anybody touch it. Don't let anybody photograph it. It's not magic but you couldn't convince the peasants of that. Another example of how the Bolsheviks did something that resonated in culture unexpectedly and without them knowing it. It was widely read, wildly received by the peasantry. Now when I thought about this, I thought, oh, I get it. The members of the Politburo at the time, the first generation of Soviet leaders, were yesterday's workers and peasants. They carried that culture with them. There was no member of the Politburo at this time more than two generations from the peasant village. More than two generations from relatives who still believed in magic, who still buried afterbirth under the corner of the house to keep demons away. Within their living memory, these Bolsheviks, that was their culture. Consciously, though, and not dishonestly, they were atheistic, atheistic, scientific Bolsheviks. The body was nothing but chemicals. But unconsciously, they carried the Russian traditions about sacred bodies. They would never admit it. They didn't ever admit it. When the body began to be magic, they tried to stop it. But they still left it there they still preserved it there because something ringing around in their unconscious, something thousands of years old, something their fathers and grandfathers would have intuitively understood, eventually won out. Their grandfathers would know exactly what this meant. They denied it in the fore part of their brain, but did it in the back part of their brain. They inherited a culture without trying to and while fighting it every step of the way. Cultural structures are durable and powerful and not easily ended or deflected. Why a body? What is there in Russian history about a body? Well, we can look at several things here. One of the things we can look at is Russian politics, right? One man rules for life until he dies. It's always been that way right up close to the present. Power is understood in Russia and has always been understood as personal, not constitutional, not legal. Russians don't think of the state as a kind of abstract thing that exists separate from the people who run it. It's not an existing entity, this state. It's the person 
who runs it. The person is the state. Power in Russia for thousands of years and today is determined not by what office you hold, not by rank, what rank you have, not by what ministry you run, but how personally close you are to a more powerful person. We call this patronage, by the way. Patronage, connection to powerful people, patrons and clients, is the Russian understanding of politics. Not laws, not states, not constitutions. There's another difference between Russia and the West about power and politics. It's often said that in the West, in medieval France, let's say, the king had two bodies, figurative speaking. There was his physical body, and then there his political body. I'm Louis, that other body is the king. Two bodies. Now, over the centuries, these two bodies got eroded by challenging institutions, parliaments, constitutions. And eventually, in the West, the sacred second body was replaced by a constitution, by a state. The king became just another person, like today in England or Netherlands. Nobody imagines these kings or queens are in any way personifying the state. But in Russia, the king only had one body in popular understanding. He was the state. There is no state without the king, the czar the prince. We can see this in language, by the way. The word for lord, dominating lord in Russian, is gasudar. The word for state, when they ever used it, was gusudarstvo. The lord and the state come from the same word and are thought of the same, as the same thing. When, when Louis XIV in France famously said, I am the state, that couldn't hold a candle to Russian understanding about the guy being the state. Louis was kind of making a little joke. Louis was kind of saying something that kind of nobody really believed. If a Russian prince or a czar had said that, there would have been no question, of course he's the state. Because there's no other institution available. This, by the way, is the origin of what we call cults of personality, cults of leaders, the cult of Stalin, we often talk about. The Russian leaders throughout the centuries have been branded. Their understanding as leader of the state has been in many ways advertised through iconography. The leader of the state was supposed to be the father of the country, patriarchal. This is Nicholas II, the last czar. One of his attributes was strength. The leader is strong. There's a big strong Lenin with troops there. Make no mistake, Lenin is powerful through armed strength. Stalin and Lenin together in gigantic form have tanks and soldiers. The leaders are strong. The state, the army, the father is in charge of them. There's an even larger Stalin with airplanes and tanks. Once again, the icon of the strong, patriotic, strong armed patriarchy leader. Even poor broken down Brezhnev was presented as a military expert of some kind. People used to say, how does he stand up with all those medals on his coat? None of which he actually earned. Nevertheless, it was important to continue to project the ancient image of the patriarchal leader of the armed country. <laughs> this isn't an accident by Gorbachev's branders. We look at it as ridiculous and silly, but it's in the tradition. It's in the icon tradition of the powerful patriarch leader who is armed maybe with a spaceship, maybe with a rifle. The leader is also kind. And over the centuries, the iconography of the leader, remember too, this is the iconography of the state. The leader is kind, the state is kind. 
often with children. Here's Lenin with children. Lenin, by the way, hated children. But never mind, the image had to be produced and reproduced. Stalin was said to be the best friend of children. Not all would agree, I'm pretty sure. But the image had to be maintained because the state is kind. And since the leader is the state, he's kind too. There's Gorbachev with children. Gorbachev goes one better, he likes animals. He hugs puppies and kisses horses. You can't get much kinder than that. Now it's especially important in his tenure to project kindness because the economy has been hardly kind to people. Other leaders, by the way, in other countries did the same thing. Here's Nasser of Egypt with children. Even Hitler liked children or is presented as liking children. Mao Zedong, we don't know what he actually thought of children, but he was often photographed with them. The leader equals the state equals kindness, as well as arm strength. Even the current little Kim, who's running North Korea, is surrounded by, it's not clear whether they are children or girlfriends. <laughs> But boy, is he kind to them. <laughs> Putin has his limits with this kindness thing, with this patrimonial thing. He has no objections to, be cons to, to being considered the father, the state, armed, kind. He allows himself to be branded. But he's got his limits. One of those limits, limits has to do with the Russian tradition of kissing the hand of the Tsar. Putin doesn't want to be kissed. Watch him visit a monastery. Ooh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, he did. Nevertheless, he did what czars are supposed to do at monasteries. He took it under his patronage and gave it money. And everybody knew now that this monastery was favored by the czar. Russian rulers get their authority passed down through the ages. We call this apostolic succession. It's like the Pope. The Pope has to trace his lineage back to St. Peter. And the thing that gives him authority is that he is somehow descended from St. Peter. He is the new apostle, apostolic succession. Same thing was true in Russia. Part of the reason the, the czar, the president, is the state is because he is properly descended in a line of succession from others like that. Here are the descendants of the Romanovs, the Romanov dynasty, with Nicholas II being the last guy, traced all the way back to a 17th century czar. The line of succession is important. He's not just anybody. He's special because his ancestors were special. The communists did the same thing. Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin. Apostolic succession comes from Marx as the, the progenitor, the, the founder, maybe even before him the idea of communism. But these leaders, these Russian leaders, have to establish a line of succession. Here's the last Tsar, Nicholas II, and his son, Alexei, in a standard succession picture. The ruler is always on the left, the successor, the heir, is always on the right the standard formula for presenting this descendant idea. Lenin on the left, Stalin on the right. Same icon, same idea. It goes down through the communist ages, if you will, or the communist rulers. It's a way of designating a successor. Although it gets modernized in the process, there's Putin on the left and the successor Medvedev on the right. In this case, the uh, current, 
current holder, the current prince, looks a little bit apprehensive, if not terrified. But the picture does the same thing that all of these earlier pictures did. A visual way to show legitimacy and proper succession. What we have here in these pictures, czar to Putin, what we have here is a kind of a strange mixture of the ancient and the modern. The modern is somehow captured by the, age, the ancient. Now, modern Ru Russian rulers no longer trace their lineage to God, but they trace their lineage to a mythical, powerful idea or person. The body is still important. Whether you trace your image back to Rurik, the legendary Viking that established the Russian dynasty, or to Marx, you're still tracing something. And that tracing, that continuity of person to person, also is supposed to speak to the continuity of the state. The state. The state, too, is continuous. The state lived, lives, and will always live, just like the bodies. This got to the point where I actually saw, I was not allowed to photograph, in a Russian church, an icon of Stalin. A guy who killed more priests than anybody probably in history. But he was the ruler, he was the state, and therefore he was somehow incorporated into religious belief. Most Russian princes and czars over the years were eventually canonized. They were holy people because they descended from holy people. Making Stalin into an icon is, is in that tradition. It's in that path. Like the state, bodies don't decay if they're holy. In fact, most recently, the last czar, Nicholas II, was canonized. He's now a saint. Because he was a ruler. And I wouldn't be surprised if 20 years from now somebody dug him up and tried to prove that his body was not decaying. The religious and the, and the political bleed into each other. They have the same methods of continuity, the same methods of iconography, of picture presentation. Which brings us to the mausoleum, which I think is one of the most interesting buildings around. The body in the mausoleum is a symbol of the state for everybody to see. The mausoleum, as my colleague Vladimir Paperny pointed out some time ago, is the center of Moscow, the spiritual center, the geographical center. And inside it is the undecaying body of the holy originator of the state, who therefore is somehow the state. There were competing designs for the mausoleum. There was a five-year competition. What kind of mausoleum to build? Another example of the way they're stumbling into this and not really deciding. A national contest. You could send in your own design for Lenin's mausoleum. And the vast majority of the contestants were modern. The motifs were modern, if not abstract. Very avant-garde stuff. And industrial ideas. This was actually a functioning radio tower above Lenin's body. This version of the mausoleum with a convenient entrance and exit at opposite ends was going to show lightning. I mean, we're talking here about real electrical static lightning shooting back and forth while the visitors were inside contemplating the body. One of my American colleagues said it's really unfortunate that the Russian language doesn't have an analog for what we would say, Lenin sure screwed the country. <laughs> doesn't work in Russian. But it's industrial. 
Some of them are just plain strange, just weird. The committee, I think, got a good laugh at some of these. What is that supposed to be? Some kind of weird communist historical Disneyland ride. And what about this? Lenin hated boats, he got seasick. <laughs> Whose idea was it to have a funny black obelisk with stars on it next to a sailing ship? Nobody knows. But in the end, they picked a very conservative pyramid put forward by architect Shusev, who designed actually a lot of things in Moscow. Why this pyramid? Well, on the one hand, 1924, 25, 26 was part of the, the worldwide King Tut craze. His body, his mummy had just been, you know, unearthed, discovered, and pyramids were just fashionable. That's part of it. Part of it, though, is that a pyramid speaks of immortality. A pyramid houses a body that doesn't die. It is monumental. The Egyptian pyramids are still there. They last forever. Communism like that and like the guy inside will last forever. Something about pyramids. But this particular pyramid, like so much else I'm talking about here, is a mixture of the ancient and the modern. On the one hand, it's a recognizable pyramid. On the other hand, it's in the ultra-modern architectural style of constructivism. Simple lines, squares, no curves anywhere, nothing fanciful. The idea behind constructivism was the body as machine. I'm sorry, the building as machine. So the final decision here was part archaic and part modern. Its location also shows this peculiar mixture of the ancient and the modern in Russian culture. There it is, a ancient and modern building at the same time on Red Square. On the far left, you see St. Basil's Cathedral of the 16th century. Just behind the mausoleum, you see one clock tower of the Kremlin Wall. This particular one is an English clock of the 19th century. To the right, you see the Kremlin, a Renaissance fortress of the 15th century. The styles are, the concepts are, as, as Ken Jowett from Berkeley said, all mixed up. The ancient and the modern are all mixed up. We shouldn't be surprised in the modern age to see ancient stuff peeking through. For years, from the beginning, Soviet leaders stood on the mausoleum on ceremonial occasions. Here's the early wooden mausoleum before they built the stone one in 1929. Here you have Stalin and the early group of Politburo members. The symbolism here, if you think about it for a minute, What's being communicated here? What's being communicated here is several things. Permanence, pyramid, modernity, constructivism. But more than that, the warriors are standing on the body of the chieftain. This could well be a burial mound 2000 BC housing the remains of the real or imagined clan founder and on ceremonial occasions, the warriors stand on top to identify themselves with him, to identify themselves with the clan, with the state. They are quite literally standing on the body. It continues through the ages. This is from the Brezhnev period. Also from the Brezhnev period. There's one little interesting story here. Nikita Khrushchev in his memoirs, and if you want to learn a lot about Soviet history, pick up one of the three volumes of Khrushchev's memoirs. He said that on these, these special occasions where they all stood there in, in kind of rough order of seniority, he said, he said, we got wind of the fact that the CIA was studying who was standing next to who. 
and trying to establish the pecking order, Kremlinology, it was called. He said, we found out about that, and so what we decided to do was mix ourselves up at random just to screw with them. <laughs> Which they apparently did. But there's another thing here. The warriors are standing on the body, yes. The body is the undecaying accidental relic of the founder, the origin of the state. He is housed in a building that's part ancient and part modern. Going in there recalls the ancient again, the archaic, the music, the lighting, the elements of the church, ancient and modern, all mixed up. But the kicker is, on top of all of this archaism, this ancient stuff, tempered with the modern, in the basement are two permanently functioning 24-7 pathology laboratories just in case the body does go south one day. The whole edifice, therefore, of ancientness, archaic culture, complete with the warrior standing on the body, mediated by science, is held up by 20th century science. Russian culture and the body itself is all about a mixture of the ancient and the modern. right down to the present with TV cameras. It's also another way of saying this ancient and modern stuff, us standing up here, we're the leaders of the country, standing on the founder of the country. The state's immortal. This is permanence. This is stability. This is security. If I were a Soviet party official giving a speech, at this point I would say, to everyone's relief, I am concluding now, comrades. <laughs> the Bolsheviks inherited archaic political practices and incorporated them into the, into the body, into the ad hoc five year long confused decision about what to do with the body, the ancient one out. Well, they furiously denied it to each other. They implemented radical transformational policies in the country Classes were wiped out, new ones appeared, rapid industrialization, technological expertise, but they used ancient means, patrons and clients, political clans, ancient symbolism. The big difference here between the goals and the means. Lenin's body, therefore, was not just a tool, not just a cynical tool put out there to fool peasants. It was a reflection of culture ancient culture, a culture inherited by the Bolsheviks, but operative at a subconscious level. They would have furiously denied it if you told them this is what they were doing, and sincerely denied it, because that's not what they thought they were doing. But it's what they did anyway. Finally, I'm going to leave you with a quote. This was a reference, by the way, to the 19th century, not the 20th, but it still holds. Reading these regulations, modern regulations, instructions and orders, ukazes, you can't rid yourself of the impression that European Russia is growing from the debris of the devastated past. From the half-faded pages of these documents, through the outer shell of the jargon, old Muscovite Russia gazes upon you, having successfully stepped over the threshold and settled comfortably in the new framework. The ancient gazes at us, persisting, settling comfortably in what we mistake for modernity and modernism. And I want to end here with, with a plea. If you ever find yourself watching television and a cartoon comes on, vote for Lenin. <laughs> He's far and away the best mummy. Thank you very much. We'll uh, raise the lights so I can see, uh, look out, and we have a few minutes for questions.
Um, I think he's right. This is a very good question. One of the most important documents in Soviet history is Lenin's so-called testament, where he wrote down a lot of impressions about who might succeed him, saying good things and bad things. It was followed by a kind of an extra testament that said Stalin should be removed. He's too rude. He's too mean. Now, Lenin saying somebody should be removed is the kiss of death for Stalin's career. It turned out it wasn't, because by that time, Lenin had had three strokes and nobody really took him seriously. He was saying a lot of things. But the interesting thing here is that the latest research by Kotkin of Princeton took this document. When was it produced? When was it publicized? Was it actually registered as one of his utterances? Did he actually say it? He concludes that it was a fake, a forgery to begin with, designed by Stalin's opponents to try to torpedo his career. Most people think the question's still open, but it's, it's pretty doubtful. Video copies of this program are available for purchase from the UCLA Instructional Media Library. Call toll-free 1-877-958-2200.